So I'm going to call this meeting to order. <laughs> yeah. Calling the one on the Housing Authority Board of Commissioners Regional Meeting, Tuesday, August 20th, 2024, to order. Should we wait for her? I'm not sure if she's going to join or not, so I can just know that Is, is Marcia coming on? Yeah, that's right. Oh, she doesn't. She yeah. doesn't know. Okay, no. I thought you were talking about... Um, no, can you see she's logged on? Oh, she is. Yeah. All right. Uh, so <laughs> I get confused about who's Zooming and who is <laughs> So, um, uh, let's do roll call. Uh, Joan Cut Chair. Um, Susie Long Baring, Commissioner. Commissioner Yarmour. Commissioner McCoy. Commissioner Chris. Deputy City Attorney Jamie Rock. Housing Director Molly O'Donnell. Sarah Reddy, Public Safety. Can you name this kind of supervisor? Zach Adams, Assistant Interim Rooms. I'm the Chief Assistant Director Lawrence Slint. Interim Executive Director Harold Wingus. Karen Rodriguez, Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, do we have any agenda revisions or submissions? No. Yeah. So can we, I need a motion to re, to approve the July 16th, 2024 minutes, unless there are any uh, revisions. Do we have any revisions? Seeing none, I have a motion. I move uh, that uh, we approve the July 16th, 2024 minutes. Second. So moved by uh, Councilor McCoy, seconded by Councilor Dalvo Ferry, to approve the July 16th, 2024 minutes. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, all those opposed? That passes. And if you are here, do you vote? That's what I wanted clarification. So if she was not here for the meeting, would she vote on that? No. So that passes um, six to uh, five. five, five to one. Zero. Zero, because she didn't vote against. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I did. What did you say she was saying? Yeah. So actually, it is six to zero with Councillor Yarbrough. Uh, Five to zero with Council with Commissioner Yarbrough, Yarbrough abstaining. abstaining. <laughs> and um, <laughs> Commissioner Martin absent. Holy yeah. Yeah. Okay. Public invited to be heard. Seeing no one. No one. Oh wait, oh, 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 Bella. Oh, oh, she just she looked at you and like just said no. You. No, just I thought you left. <laughs> I came back. <laughs> Hi. Hi. So we are now at public invited to be heard. Is there anyone in the public that would like to be heard? Yes, there is. <laughs> okay, step right up. That should be I didn't see you. Uh, do I still need to give my name and address? Oh, sure, why not? Okay, Shaquille Lawal, 19 Francis Street. Uh, commissioners, I'm here to invite you and all members of the public to a presentation on housing affordability. This presentation is being hosted by Launch Longmont Housing is being hosted at the heart of Longmont Church. Proceeds will go to benefit the Wesley Town Home Project, which are 11 permanently affordable homes for families that are being built in collaboration with the in-between uh, and will replace a parking lot. Our program will open with remarks by the pastor, Claire McKelty Drew, as a part of Longmont, who will speak on the moral case for housing affordability. Our invited speaker is Chuck Marone, the founder of Strong Towns, a nationally known organization founded in 2008 which promotes policies which improve the financial sustainability of cities. Strong Town's ideas are influential, having inspired both state and federal legislation, and countless other organizations like Launch trying to make cities great places to live. These policies, not coincidentally, also improve housing affordability, public transit uptake, walkability, bikeability, and general quality of life. Uh, to paint with a broad brush, Strong Town's advocates for policy changes which are actually under the control of local governments, and that can make a huge impact in the city. They advocate for sensible urban planning policies that discourage sprawl, reduce traffic, and promote local businesses without creating fiscal cliffs for cities through horizontal expansion. Uh, we believe that these policies and ideas are particularly relevant to Longmont, given that we are at our horizontal limit, and that outcomes like housing affordability and promotion of multimodal transit are high on the priority list for most of the public and also for city council. Uh, this event is Thursday, September 12th at 6.30 p.m. at the heart of Longmont Church. Tickets are $7 and proceeds benefit the uh, Wesley Town Home Project. And tickets are available at launchlongmonthousing.org through Eventbrite. After Chuck's talk, there will be Q&A and we'll be hosting a fair for other organizations in town that do advocacy work around housing affordability so that attendees can learn how to get involved themselves and learn who is doing good work in the community. 
Thank you, Shaquille. Thank you. September 12th? 6.30 p.m. All right. Okay. After that, I'm going to be all the new business. First one on the list is Resolution LHA 2024-16, approve acceptance of a grant from the University of Denver for research of trauma-informed design at the Suites Department. Um, I forgot to write a memo, so I apologize. <laughs> um, basically, um, 2022, I think you guys signed a memo, or an MOU, with DU to do right. some research, and they did receive the grant. They have been doing the work, um, but we never signed the sub-award agreement with them. Mm -hmm. um, it was something that I think just got caught up in all the changes that have been happening. And so we um, touched base with them, double checked with the agreement, they did some changes. It, it referenced Lisa, who was the regional, we changed that to me. Um, confirmed that we could get them some of the reports that they were asking for, because originally it said these reports and we weren't going to provide that info. Um, but some de identified de -identified, uh, incident reports from public safety was something we could provide. So we um, did some changes to the document and it's ready to go it's ready to sign we are getting six thousand dollars in return for them coming onto our property and working with the clients and, and getting some information so we just have to wrap up this document so that they can close out their grant and put us a check okay. what uh, you said you were not going to give them some of the documents they asked for originally they had listed police reports mm -hmm. and we weren't comfortable giving client data yeah they didn't want client data i think it was um, just listed in there, but really what they wanted is um, incident data okay. the property, which okay. is something we can get, we get from Sarah. Just call for service. Yeah. Okay. So we were able to run a report and send that to them. Okay. And just a reminder, the suites was not built with trauma-informed design, so they're participating in research in other permanent supportive housing as well to have some data to compare. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I know we get a report with the so with this grant, is there some way to get a trauma enforced design? Not, not really. It's not really enough money to do anything. No, I mean it's it's really just covering the admin time for the okay. property manager to do some extra work. Okay. Um, we are we, we did get a grant from the city mm -hmm. to replace the doors, which will help because that's one thing that causes mm -hmm. some issues at that property. Um, but really, uh, until we do like a huge tear down and rehab type thing, you know, it's it's just designed to be a hotel, so it doesn't. It's not ideal, but mm -hmm. so that's kind of the research they're looking at is what to do, what not to do. Okay. okay. So, um, is there any? Are there any other questions from the council? Seeing so that, I have a motion to approve this. I move we approve uh, resolution uh, LHA. 24, uh, 20, 24, 16. Okay, it's been moved by Councilor McCoy, seconded by Councilor McCoy, that we approve the motion of Commissioner. It's been moved by Commissioner McCoy, seconded by Commissioner Yarbrough, that we approve 20, 24, 16. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? And that passes 6 2 0. And Commissioner Martin. Uh, absent. We are on now LHA 2024-17, which is to approve memorandum of understanding regarding services and leasing for Xenia apartments. Okay. Um, so this is a document that we are uh, participating in creating with Element, the developer of Xenia. The All Roads, which is well, Boulder Shelter for the Homeless, which is now All Roads, but the agreement is written as Boulder Shelter, which is, they still can sign as that. And then um, well, the Mental Health Partners. We've already signed one year ago. We signed a property management agreement with Element, and that outlines our responsibilities. This does not change our responsibility at all in that. It really, um, it references it, and it, it highlights certain elements of that. But we had nothing that had all four parties together understanding rules and responsibilities for um, tenant selection and uh, voucher administration and how the services are provided and who talks to who really to get to get this job done and make the uh, 
residents at Zinnia have a seamless experience and have our administration be seamless as well. So um, there's nothing really new here that we haven't talked about in the past about how we're managing this, but this is just more of the formalization of our roles and responsibilities across the four parties. So um, both, is Michael Block going to be part of the mm -hmm. management of this? Yes. Um, his Spencer Downing is the supportive services manager. He's who really the boots on the ground, um, and his staff are the ones performing, performing sort of supportive services. So when we do our we, we meet whew, we meet weekly with all four parties, and it's really Spencer that's there in his group. Um, Michael was involved a lot in some of the early decision making, and he's in the background. But it is Spencer is the in charge of supportive services. But to be clear on this one, so. We're the owner of the project is Element. Right. Mm -hmm. Element is part of the tax credit application for supported services contracted with All Roads. Shelter for the Homeless, All Roads. Um, and that was primarily because of the supported services component associated right. with this. And they were the only organization that really had that cap capacity, and that was at the same time that Bluebird. Mm -hmm was built in, in Boulder because they're both owned by Element. We're not the, in this case, in this project, we're not the owner of the project. We're merely the property manager of the project. Special so limited partner, partner, but not necessarily decision-making authority as an owner. Okay. Um, and <coughs> does uh, no health partners have enough staff? So in, in this instance, they are only doing the voucher administration in this one. They won't be doing the support services. That's all, all roads. Um, so on the voucher administration side, we have been working with a dedicated team so far. Yeah, that's the difference between this and the suites. The suites mm -hmm. mental health partners are supposed to provide the support. That, a portion of the supportive services. That's, that's been tricky in the past. That's why we brought in clinician positions into this because in talking to the state, everyone realizes that when the suites, it was the first permanent supported housing project, everybody knows it wasn't done well um, in terms of supported services, security, and all of those issues. So those things, you know, when, when the suites was done, they funded it for two years and then two years hit and there was no money. Figure it out. Figure it out. Now, okay. all of these things are built in within the pro forma for our Okay, great. Any other questions? I can have Commissioner Preston. Molly, on the tenant selection plan, uh, eligibility criteria, uh, the fifth thing is the student eligibility. Mm -hmm. It says if, if a single applicant uh, would be rejected unless one of the following criteria is I don't quite understand this because wouldn't it be positive for a student? So this is HUD rules. This is verbatim HUD rules for IRS. Uh, IRS. Okay. IRS. IRS rules. IRS rules. Yeah. What did I say? HUD. Yeah. IRS rules for tax credits. Tax credits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so this is verbatim from the rules. This is applies across all low-income housing tax credit properties, and it's really because um, it can get very, when there is a student that's a full-time student, it's either working, sometimes they're living with family, sometimes the whole family is involved in the household income calculation, and so there are very, very specific rules about how um, full-time students can be included in the low-income housing tax credit property. And we went, uh, this tenant selection plan, this has um, been blessed by you as the Board of Commissioners. We brought this in, I think, maybe May or June. I think um, we asked. I thought we asked. We did. We did. Yes. 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 I was wondering if it was tied in yet or earlier. But, yeah, it was um, this one. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. I knew a little bit more about that because we actually had a bunch of students apply. And I had to track down. If you're a tenant already, so you met the eligibility, and then you decide to go to school, 
this. So, so it the tenant selection plan only depends. apply yeah, a tenant selection plan only triggers when you're entering as a tenant. Once you're a tenant, then we look at your income changes annually mm -hmm. and that's where it starts to play a role. So the, the rule if you don't meet a there's a couple exceptions. Um, if you don't meet those exceptions and you've been a full time student as determined by the university, which is they make that up, they determine what that is university level for five months out of a calendar year you are ineligible so if you go part-time you are fine so we actually have a tenant who was going to be starting full-time in the fall had enrolled in April and we were just at the four-month mark where she made the decision to drop down to a part-time status and remove some of her financial aid in order to be housed as a new it's a really tough call. There is some federal legislature out there being proposed to make it easier for students who are receiving the Pell Grant to get so we need to write our Congress people. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. what it's called. Yeah, and it's supposed to be coming Yeah. 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 The opportunity yeah. The initial intent was so that people could not use the low income or the LIHTC tax credit program to build students. But now the many years have passed from 30 to 40. 1970 was 30 years ago in my mind. So <laughs> you can tell me the number. Uh, but it's time to change. So I think that's what some federal legislators are trying to work out. So you feel so inclined to support that? That is it. Thank you. Any other questions on the leasing? Seeing that, can I have a motion for 2024-17? Um, I'll move for resolution LHA 2024-17. Second. It's been moved by Commissioner Hidalgo Perry, seconded by Commissioner Christ, to move to LHA 2024-17, approving the memorandum, the MOD regarding Lucy and Prisinia. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? And that passes six to zero when Councillor uh, no Commissioner yeah. Martin has it. Back to where well, we're on the voucher funding projections discussion. Uh, and this is about Xenia or about all of the LHA. Okay. So I'm gonna open it and then we're gonna pass it to accounting for some math. Mm -hmm. um, so we've kept you in the loop on our vouchers and the funding scenarios and uh, when we get uh, uh, our funding requests approved by HUD and, and how our voucher outlook looks. Um, in the last couple of years, we have known that rent increases were going up so high that we have had this conversation with this board a couple times about how that um, impacts our payment standards, whether we pay 100% of fair market rents or we go to 105 or even 110 which was considered and I think it would I say I know we didn't do it we did we chose not to do that Boulder housing partners in Boulder County Housing Authority paid 110 percent at one point I think in 23 um, just to keep up so that people that landlords would be attracted to taking a voucher and many other reasons that that was one of the main ones um, so now that we have seen that for some time we are still renting at 100% of fair market rents right now, which seems to be the right, the sweet spot right now. But after a couple of years of this, something that is being seen across PHAs across the country is that rent increases are going up faster than our HUD funding increases, meaning all of the new funding that we get is not increasing our voucher capacity, it is only serving to pay those rent increases and not even the whole amount. So we have not been able to issue new vouchers for some time, at least a year, year and a half. Well, we stopped no. because we were adding DVDs. Yeah. Right, right, right. But also we knew that with the rent increases that um, running our two-year tool look over the past couple of years, we know that that was going to be a challenge. Mm -hmm. So here we are. It sounds like we are not the only one in this boat, but we are in what is called a funding shortfall. And so um, HUD has already been releasing um, 
public notifications about um, submitting shortfall requests. So this is out there for, for the whole country, really. Um, and so we have been preparing data to put in that request. Um, it is doubly important for us not only to just try and keep being able to issue new housing choice vouchers in the near future, but also because we have the project-based vouchers that we awarded to Village on Main and Ascent and then Atwood, if Atwood gets tax credits, um, then it is more important for us to make sure we look at this shortfall, see what opportunities are there to help us out, because what we needed to happen to get these PPVs issued and ready when the construction completes on those projects is that we needed enough attrition of our housing choice vouchers where people uh, stop participating in the program and hold those as people drop off so that we can issue the project-based vouchers. But because of funding, the funding shortfall, even with that attrition, we're still having to apply additional dollars just to keep up with the ones that we do have. So we don't necessarily, we, we have plans in place to, to get ready for this, but we're not in the most ideal situation to be able to hand over the entire um, award of vouchers right at the moment. The projects are underwritten conservative enough that specifically Village on Main, which is ready to accept those vouchers as of October, we were conservative in the underwriting. We're not, the, the project can handle it for a period of time. But we do need to get those project-based vouchers actually assigned to those properties. Um, so, I'm gonna hand it to Kendra now. If there's pause, if there's any questions as well, but she'll kind of give us some visuals on what the money looks like. So, so here's kind of what happened is, and I'm gonna show you a table. This is to, uh, some information we said on the card. Um, we kind of knew we were going to have a situation because HUD increased their fair market rents so much for 2024. We've never seen this large of an increase. And when you have vouchers in place, if you, they don't give you additional budget, you're not going to be able to fund those vouchers if those landlords take advantage of going up to the full fair market rent. Now, not all of our landlords do, but a lot of the PBBs that we have do they go up to the full fair market rent to bring that money into the tax credit properties. So here's kind of the analysis we did to HUD, and I do think this is why everyone's having shortfalls. So in 2021 to 2022, you can see they only increased it $5, 21. Then in 2023, they went 113, you know, 189, and then in 2024, and we did see a notice come from HUD that there was a, a miscalculation. And I don't know if it was on this or if it was something else as far as funding, how we calculated the funding to each agency. But, you know, you see $357. If you have a three bedroom and they go to a full fair market rent, that's $350 extra a month per, per month. So if you have all these vouchers at the beginning of January and you have that full increase, if they're not giving you enough money in that two-year period, you're gonna have a shortfall. And so this is what we've been monitoring. And every month, I hope that our vouchers don't go up and every month they do. So in July, we actually stopped issuing vouchers in prepping for the bill of John May, the 18 that we needed to add. So we had 430 last July. And we now have 414 vouchers. So we, we're down to 16. I only have two more to get that 18. However, our cost went from 516,000 to 570,000 with the reduced vouchers. Mm -hmm. So if you add that up, you have to, HUD had to give almost every agency a ton of money, depending on, you know, especially their PBBs, to be able to accommodate the increase. So here's what's happened though. They just released the 2025 rates and look what they've done, they've dropped them. So they realized too, I think, that this has caused a dramatic shortfall issue across the board. Um, we're hearing from, I mean, we're having agencies reach out to us and say, hey, can you absorb your coordinates? And we 
say, no, we can't. Yeah. Because we don't have the money to do it either. And they're, they're scrambling to try to figure out. We've heard HUD has also said, you might have to just drop people off the program. Because technically the HAP contract says, um, if, if the funding is available. You know, we can give you a voucher if the funding is available. What they're trying to do is release some additional reserves. So they, I think they have kind of a little bucket of money set aside for housing authorities that are about to run up and they have this excess reserve that they're trying to release to these agencies. And that's what, um, so our, our HUD rep reached out last Friday <laughs> and said, I need your two-year tool because you're, you're, you look like you're going to be in a shortfall. And so I submitted exactly, you know, hey, we were trying to, we haven't even been vouching up. I said, but here's why I think we're seeing what we're seeing. I mean, I went from, in July, I was at 570,000, and it went up to 580. So I can't, it, nothing's dropping, but it also doesn't help that our property taxes increase, right? right? Because then landlords are also having to accommodate for that as well. So we're waiting to hear back. I submitted the information to our, our rep. I'm waiting to hear back to see if I if that is my shortfall request or if I have to submit something different, but it has to be done by August 30th. So another option is we can talk to Tracy. I said we may need to have make a judgment call for the rest of the year to say, do we need to go down to 90 percent? Like right now we're at 100 percent. So we're we're at this level right here. But here's what's going to happen. If we're at this level and there's a landlord at 1585, and now we can only support 1466 in 2025, we have to tell that landlord the tenant has to pay the remainder of that rent, or you have to reduce yeah. your rent. So they're kind of putting tenants in a situation yeah. that could be, yeah. um, for our PVBs, that's kind of, I think, an easy, I mean, at least on our side, for the housing authority. I will be budgeting to this new fair market so that we are strapping our tenants with that. But that's what's going to start happening. On the private side. Yeah. So, I mean, is HUD willing to compensate for those shortfalls for the year 2025? Um, that I don't know. I mean, we've seen some messages that they're evaluating and that you have to submit for the shortfall, um, and they're looking at all the agencies. So we, we included, like, hey, we have two HAP contracts that we're trying to fund as well. I mean, these are kind of set in stone. These are LIHTC properties that they've already been awarded tax credits. They're expecting, you know, they put that money into these projects. So we added that into our kind of like, hey, we do need the money. <laughs> um, well, I think you just you haven't heard back. If you give us the information as council, and we also can contact them, yeah. and um, whatever we need to do to support you, yeah. and back that up and say, hey, I mean, yeah. you know, because that's that's not right for the landlords who are taking these vouchers and uh -huh. they're far, and, you know, too many that won't yeah. do it. Yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, so now these are doing it, going to be penalized for following the rules. Mm -hmm next year so I think if you need us to get involved in whatever you can formulate an email or whatever and you send it to council and I think we I know I'm willing to do it and we can send out and, and contact them right contact us and let them know that this is unacceptable unless you're gonna um, give us show us the money yeah or what's the message we need to be arguing and what are the impacts that it's going to have on residents and us I think it's Congress, I mean, you know, Congress, mm -hmm. you know, and, and our senators. No, yeah, I guess it is. Yeah. You know, you can, you know, it, this has been the year of perfect storms financially. Yeah. All over, you know, whether it's our budget, but so in order to get more money, you have to bounce it up mm -hmm. to, to show performance. So we were trying, to sh we were showing performance because we had historically not gotten more money because we were never vouchered up. So you show performance, then you go into a period of where rents are going up anyway. Mm -hmm. So that starts hitting you. And then with what Kendra showed, we went up, what, $300? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, for a three bedroom. So for a three bedroom, and so then that's coming into play, and then they realize, whoops, we went too high. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of the day, we can't pay above that number, right? Correct. So, so the landlord has 1585. The difference between the 1585 and the 1466, it, it's, it's the responsibility of the tenant. And even if we had the money, we couldn't pay the 1585. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's a, you know, yeah, it's a, it's a perfect storm. And, you know, they did this probably to balance their budget. Mm -hmm. And it's still not balanced. So, no. you yeah. <laughs> know. No, seriously, I think the sooner we can get on it, and if you want to, I'm, I'm just saying I'm willing and it's not like, you know, if some of us are really willing to step in, call, make emails, send emails to whomever we need to, um, to because with government, we all know that the one who, that's right, that's right, so that's how it works. And then we'll be there, some government officials will be in Tampa. Mm -hmm. Two that maybe we can set up some appointments when we go in Tampa, right? For uh, the national league, yeah. Give so us the talking point should be yes. the talking point. It's very well versed in how this works, but yeah. I need talking points, mm -hmm. or we can just go to the talk. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I think in, in getting briefed by them, I think there's a couple of things that in all of this, I think there's some good news in that. A, they reached out to us and said, give me your two-year tool. Mm -hmm. It looks like you're going to have this issue, which mm -hmm. is also telling me that I think our performance and making sure we're vouchering up is helping. Mm -hmm. And so it's not like we're having to try to call and find out who do we talk to about this. They've actually reached out to us. Okay. To me, that's a bit of a positive because it typically is when you're dealing with the federal government a much different situation if they reach out to you versus you're having to track them down. Mm -hmm. So maybe that'll help us in this. But mm -hmm. and, and you know, if, and this is a national issue. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, if they don't solve it, there's going to be another set of conversations in the sense of is the answer that you reduce to 90 or is the answer that you know, can you produce five vouchers and keep everything else at a hundred? Or if you reduce everyone else to 90, are you impacting too many people that they can't afford to pay it? Mm -hmm. So there's going to have to be some analysis that goes into this that we'll have to bring back to you to kind of give you the scope of, of sort of solutions um, and the impact of those solutions because. You could make put everybody in a bad position because you reduced it to 90 or 95, or you put five, ten people in a bad position mm -hmm. trying to preserve the, the bulk of this. And, and I don't know what the answer is, mm -hmm. but we're going to have to do that work. So it's it's pretty clear based on this the impact to our tenants using vouchers out in the private market. For us, on our PPD side, we're not too worried about this rental adjustment we can adjust down for our existing people in our PPD units, but for our upcoming developments, we are putting in place a plan to make sure that we can do what we plan to do. So um, Village on Main has 18 vouchers awarded, did you say we are have at up to 16 right now? We've been taking a look at a couple of different things to well, well, I've, I've, that first. I've, I've dropped 16 vouchers, but our budget is gone. So, so it's somewhere in there. I've at when I put our two-year tool, I put it kind of five vouchers consecutively for three months, and then the, the remainder. And then um, for ascent, I just put at the very bottom in December with three additional 18. But that puts us in a million dollar shortfall. Mm -hmm. Not for year one. Fine for year one. It's going to be in year two. Um, is where it's going to be. I mean, it just, I mean, and we were we were not even there, but just one month creates a whole different mm -hmm. ball game in that second year. And so we do have until, Ascent won't open until about January 2026. So we have some time to implement a plan here. For Atwood, if, if Atwood is successful in getting tax credits, which they're applying 
right now, um, we might have to say, we, it, we, we've said this from the start, but we awarded them a number of vouchers, but it's going to be subject to funding availability um, because we got to make sure, and that would be another year out from there. So there is time to work it back into this, but we are just trying to be very careful and make sure that we don't overpromise and underdeliver or I know what's weird is talking to Kinder about this, there's a, what I call seasonality to this. And so we were talking about this, I think it's Village that we were talking about on the research. Everybody has recertification at the beginning of the year. So that shifted your two year tool because here it goes again, because we were hoping there was some later in the year, because then that pushes the two years out to three years, functionally. Is that, am I saying that right? Or am I going to have it backwards? I mean, you could, you could dra drastically change your budget if everybody is on a fair <coughs> Is that what you're trying to do? Like, if every, everybody's research is in the very first month of the year, it could totally yeah. change um, what your dynamics are. Yeah, so where they sit and when they have to research, that's also impacting this too. If it's spread out, it may look like this. If it's all in the beginning, it would, if it's in the beginning, it's worse, right? Yeah. So, and if it's in the end, it's better because of the two years. And as an example, like in 2023, they they upped all of the sweets vouchers all in March. And Tracy said, well, I'm going to do it all in March. And I said, no, you're not. <laughs> yeah. So you're going to do it at their research date because we can't handle all of that all at once. We could last year because we were trying to match up. That would great. But um, yeah, not this year. So it does It does matter. So staff intends to submit the shortfall request by the August 30th deadline if that is what this board wants to direct staff to do. Yeah. Yeah. It's the only choice. Yeah. Yeah, do we have a choice for that? Yeah. So, do you need a vote direction, direction or a vote? I, just I direction's know. fine. If, count, if, if the commission's good with this, then we'll just go forward. Mm -hmm. And then we'll get you the information and maybe also reach out to our elected officials and mm -hmm. others. Are there any nays again on council to not direct? Say none. I think you have your direction to it. How is this going to affect Zenia? Because it's going to be open before a second. It will not affect Zenia at all. Oh, okay. Um, they'll be following fair market rents as we go, but those are all state funded vouchers. And so that's all of them. Okay. Well, but the state's doing the same thing. I mean, yeah, they'll be having to adjust it I mean, and figure it out as well. But they're, they're not federal project based vouchers that would be okay. affected by our shortfall request. They're not administered by LHA, but they'll be in the same boat in terms of having to adjust for this. Okay. okay. It never stops, does it? <laughs> this is the craziest thing I've ever seen because it's kind of hard to have, I mean, you want to be able to budget and set your course and, and know what you're dealing with, but it literally changes on the market. Yeah. And it, it, it's, it's the craziest thing I've ever seen. And, and, and it's things you can't control. You know, HUD controls these rent values. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of stuff that's in play. <laughs> yeah, throw that in November. Yeah, yeah no, I'm triggered, so. Yeah. <laughs> I mean. It's a good time to make people aware of this, actually. Yeah. This is a big. This is a big thing because it's been, you know, when you watch these um, budget conversations in Congress, yeah. mm -hmm. and they're haggling over balancing the budget, a lot of times in my 20 plus years of this, that's the one that a lot of times would get cut, mm -hmm. and so then they're they're scrambling too. So there's a lot of moving pieces. And a lot of dominoes that yes. could fall from this because if there's the tenants are responsible for that now, they're looking for tenant-based rental assistance, which isn't necessarily available out there. Mm -hmm. um, that is in the, in the mix on the Prop 1B discussions as well. But there'll be a need 
and it's hard to come by since COVID comes have run out. Yeah. So vote the whole ballot. Yeah. <laughs> Make sure that you pay attention to congressional well, candidates. The, and, and the tenant-based rental assistance is hard because when you're looking, when we're talking about the 1B funding, it's hard to deal with because you also have the cost of rents going up because of the lack of inventory. Yeah. So if you put your money into the tenant-based assistance program, you may be solving if you, you you may actually solve an issue today but create a bigger issue in the future because you're not expanding the units to bring the market into play to where you're not having this uncontrolled growth in rental prices. And, and so and, you know, it's going to be an interesting year. So. And then from our standpoint, when you think about this and look at, from the city's perspective, and you look at the budget issues we're dealing with with the property tax base, you know, we'll give you all a balanced budget in a week. We had to make significant adjustments within that budget in order to do it. The one thing that we didn't touch in this case was health and human service funding. But it even took a $20,000 decrease because it's a percentage of your total revenues coming in. And, you know, depending on what happens with some of this property tax legislation, there could be a bigger gap. Well, I was telling, Cal, um, I was telling Aaron earlier that um, Commissioner Rodriguez, you know, we know what we're giving you. We don't have Boulder County's number. So literally, we won't get it Friday at the best, Monday at the worst. So I theoretically could give you a balanced budget that's out of balance because the number from Boulder County. Now, why don't we have it? They're not legally required to give it to us until the 25th of August. We've got Will County stuff. We don't have it. But when you think about this broader system, mm -hmm. and you can see the shuttering in the system, is okay so now health and human service funding is down twenty thousand. if there's another hit you know i will be talking to you all about do we lower some of that to grab ongoing money and use one-time funding to make up the difference so we can manage the ongoing core functions of the city but you have more needs and more people going for health and human service funding because of gaps that you're seeing in this and it's, it's it's going to be an interesting time period. So then, on the other side of it, um, we have the 1B funding, which could be a, a significant assistance to us that we're advocating is really based, distributed by population across the city, or across the county. That could be in play, but you don't want to necessarily do that. I mean, we're going to be juggling a lot of balls in multiple budgets trying to, to wrap our arms around this entire issue. Are there other sources besides the 1B? For? For um, helping services. Uh, no, we'd have to, I mean, if we wanted to allocate more money, we would have to cut somewhere else. There is another grant. There are individualized grants out there. This is all coming out of the Human Services Department, um, but it's not like a, it's not like housing where there's an entire state division giving out funding that you apply for, and it could be for development. Or it's it's usually much more targeted to specific uses, and it's smaller pots when we've got um, different grants for different purposes. So it's kind of a different world on the services side, which tenant-based rental assistance often falls into that side. Well, I would also, and this sounds really bleak, I think there's solutions. We can find solutions and we can, we can figure it out. The one thing about tenant-based rental assistance that we've learned from COVID that I was talking to Nuria about this today is it actually in some cases made the situation worse because people got the tenant-based rental assistance during COVID, it went away. People got used to that and still had margins and gaps 
you know, because the assistance was there because the jobs weren't there. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, um, we're, we're seeing a little bit, not as bad as some of the other communities have, yeah, but it, that's another piece. Yeah, that's, it, it's not going to change the rent value. Right. They're always going to have to get up there whether this source is available or not. I think that also triggered, because that rental assistant went away, triggered the um, ask from people going back to jobs or looking for other jobs for higher salaries. You know, so uh, it just dominoed effect to everything. So. All right, you have your direction, and we'll try to help you out at an LC. <laughs> yeah. uh, we're at the develop, the, oh. Do you report interim executive yep. director report on development updates? So I'll go ahead and start on this. Um, since we talked about the 1B funding, obviously we've presented to you all about um, really pushing to have 1B funding allocated proportionally based on the population. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a few conversations going on. The, the city manager group came together. Um, and really, we drafted a letter basically supporting the regional housing partners proposal. And um, and so there's a few things that are going to be happening. There's a, a weekly meeting Monday that where this is going to be discussed. Um, you you have seen the re regional housing partners proposal with that breakout and that funding. Um, another group sent out another proposal that is similar to that proposal, but the smaller communities work with Together Colorado to basically pull their funds together, but then Boulder and Long Rock work the same. In their proposal, we actually ended up with more money than we did in the Regional Housing Partnership proposal. Um, I think it's boiling down to a few things. Uh, one of the things that the our Regional Housing Partner group said is we don't want to be want to be the board that provides oversight on this. Is that yeah. correct? If for a competitive funding right. process, not not washing hands through the development of this distribution right. model. And so the um, where it's coming from now is the city managers are starting to slide in and having conversations that we think it needs to be us. And so I will be there Monday um, to talk about that piece. And so Nuri and I talked today um, to, to provide the broader kind of oversight group on this. There will be an advisory board, but somehow we're in here. So we're talking about that. Um, I'm also going to talk about how cities can leverage this funding uh, in terms of if there was a project that we wanted to own that was in the neighborhood of $80 million. When you look at the pro forma, it starts spending a lot of cash out. The problem is, is that if you do a traditional, if, if you go in to finance it, you can't get essentially that lower interest loan that governments can unless you have the full faith and credit of the city behind you, which creates other financing issues. But if we get the direct allocation, and we can take some of that money and you do a traditional debt service on, on revenue bonds or a COP based on the revenues covering 100%. If you cover the 25 to 30% debt ratio to take you to 125, 130 with the funding that comes in, then you can get that lower interest rate, which then allows ownership opportunities to come in. So then you can pull in a million or so dollars in year one then you get to year seven, theoretically, and you start getting hundreds of thousands. Then you get to year 12, and you're in seven digits in terms of revenue. But then, so you cycle the money in, that coverage, you cycle the money out, put it into another project. You get this year's allocation, you do the same thing. That's a 15-year duration. That's seven years you're refinancing. And, and then you're sitting on about $30 million of equity on that $80 million project, which then lets you issue a different debt structure on another project. 
and you're spending out the money, which then, when we talk about these financial issues, you start seeing that that is part of the solution. That you can start bringing it to bear into some of these. So you're making yourself more resilient over time financially, but you need that direct allocation coming in from the one B funds in order to do this financing model. So I'll be talking about that. And um, can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. <laughs> So if the, if the city managers are doing this and the cities are all all looking at what allocation they they want, and one city has the eight million dollar uh, eighty million dollar project, does that take away from allocation of other cities? No. Okay. You use it out of your allocation. All right. Yeah. And frankly, I don't know why everybody wouldn't do something like this. To be honest with you, but. It's a different proposal. Uh, Denver Housing Authority is actually doing a version of this than what I talked about. It just looks different because the city of Denver has a direct tax that then they push to the Housing Authority and then they're using it that way. It's kind of that same model. Um, so, it, and I, correct me, Harold, if this is not what you have in mind, but um, it, we wouldn't actually even use, unless it was gap funding to help that project, but we wouldn't actually have to reserve that funding except for, um, in this case, it's really just providing that cushion if needed, if there's ever a shortfall in the income of the project. It's more of a, a guarantee, okay. um, and it's leveraging the funding that we have, knowing that we have an ongoing source for 15 years to act as that catch-all if needed. Sounds complicated, but I'm glad you figured it out. <laughs> I mean, it's similar to how some people, how you would finance your home. Mm -hmm. it, it's just the numbers are dramatically larger, but, you know, it's, it's when they look at your bank accounts and your savings and all of that and what you have. Yeah. We're just using this mechanism to get a lower interest rate because, you know, it starts, the interest rate starts looking almost like a double A. Mm -hmm which is that right now, four and a quarter-ish. September, it could be below that. And because the feds are talking and crying about this, and they're projecting maybe three, they're going to lower it three times at a quarter point each. So, you know, if you can get a double A at four and a quarter to four and a half, then maybe by the time the deal comes together, you're four, you know, maybe high threes, that also changes the economics of the, the total deal financially, which then maybe it's not one and a half million, maybe it's 1.2 million. So, but that's kind of what I'm talking to the group about the direct allocation on local control doing it. I'm also talking to them about the fact that, you know, we have to be really careful that we don't have one group running a process and giving money to somebody who wants to do a project in another municipality. Mm -hmm. Because if the municipality itself is running its projects, just like you saw with the vouchers, mm -hmm. you're planning this out over time. And the challenge then creates almost a conflict point where then somebody can get money over here. They then come to us and go, we want vouchers, we want local financial assistance, we want permit fee waivers, but we may be at capacity in what we could do, and so now you have a group that got money that can't use it in the municipality. And so trying to eliminate those conflict points really, in my mind, makes more sense for the money to go to the municipalities, because um, if we're not mindful of what's happening within the jurisdiction, there's Ten ways you'll you'll run in you'll have a train for you know, train wreck. So that's what I'm going to be talking to them about on Monday. I just wanted you all to, to know that ahead of time. Right now, the regional housing partnership, all the communities in it, the small, medium, and large, are all aligned on this methodology. And now we've got the service providers that have been actively participating coming in to do a joint proposal. Um, so it's it's a, just a lot of alignment and. Everyone sees the value at this point, so that would be what we did get to. Yeah, and then the service providers are different based on community. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like here we have our center and hope that are kind of 
the two biggest that we have. We have a lot of small other service providers. In Lafayette and you know that area, you have Sister Carmen. You know, Boulder has its group, and again, we all have different needs and different issues. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of hard for any community to, it's kind of hard as a county to say, this is how we're going to split it. Because I've been arguing to them, our issues here are probably more significant than the other communities when you look at our just our demographics and you look at our economic demographics. We're the most diverse economically. And, and so our wage structures are lower than other places in the county. Lions is, you know, oddly in a similar position. And so those are all things that I'm going to be saying to them as to why it really needs to be in the cities. And then we can work collectively with each other. Mm -hmm. But if, if we're blind to our own local issues, I just think there's going to be challenges. Yeah. So you all know what I'm going to say on Monday. I wanted to get that out as part of my, my report. And I'll turn it over tomorrow. Sure. Thank you for taking that on. All right, so that was your report on the uh, operations? Oh, no, that was just my, that was my report. They're going to do development and then operations. So we'll continue with our development projects. Okay. So uh, the biggest news right now is Ascent. Uh, we are still continuing to work towards closing. The anticipated date is now September 9th. Um, that is, we were really shooting for the end of July, but a couple of things, um, are, have prevented that, but we're working through them bit by bit. One of them is that there's a, a lumen easement that um, the Penrose team and the, the architectural team needs to work to have lumen in their facilities before we can get the site plan completed. Um, and then on the other side, there's still some uh, outstanding loan documents that we're waiting for. Um, getting those subordination agreements through. And then we have been negotiating the lease for the Early Childhood Education Center and with the Colorado Health Foundation to make sure we get the grant funding set and our milestones agreed to, all of which has happened. Um, and we're finalizing that lease with the Wild Plum now, all of which the investors want to see, um, even if we, they won't be occupying the building until 2026. So we've just been working through all the, the details of that. So that is our anticipated closing date. That means construction will be ready to rock right then. Um, and that means our opening date is, should be January, February 2026. Um, so that's been a, a big lift lately, just a big focus. Village on Main, I hope you've walked by, driven by, and seen all of the stuff happening outside. Um, there's still a ton happening inside too. Um, but. We are running on schedule. That should be complete. We're going to have a substantial completion of that at the end of September. I think we'll be planning a, a um, grand reopening celebration of some sort in around October. Um, so the parking lot has been closed for several weeks, which turns out was a great thing. We uh, ended up working with the LDDA and Boulder County Housing Authority to, to lease spaces at the spoke just so we didn't have residents. Um, trying to find parking, but also not having, you know, nails and tires or anything. So we could really just shut down the parking lot and get the whole thing done at once. So they'll be, uh, we're reopening the parking lot for the first week of September. Um, and I hope everyone likes the colors on the outside, because that was, it took us a long time to sort out what would be the right pick. So um, it's looking great on the inside as well. Our last round of tenant move outs just here, happened here um, a short time ago, and so we're on the last phase. Fantastic. We're getting there. So then we move into everything that happens at the end of construction, so that's our next phase that we're all starting to get prepared to get all of that documentation ready to get our developer fees and everything else that goes with it. Um, those two projects are, are all encompassing right now, so that might be the extent of our development updates. We have some other stuff in the pipeline that we've been talking about, and, and we've mentioned Atwood is still uh, going back in for tax credits. Um, but on the LHA side, that is the, the biggest area of work. The, the village looks great. I, I saw it the other day, and I thought, wow, this looks really, really nice. It stands out, which helps. That's what we were, we wanted it to look like it melded with 
this twerk downtown yeah. not being a 1990 peak right. knockoff, <laughs> but um, but also being it's you know it's downtown. It could be a little bit more striking. Yes, you know, yes. it doesn't have to fade into the background. It can be a, a you know good anchor for that block. So where are we on the electrical equipment coming in? Um, we've got it all sorted. We're getting the electrical equipment in in time. There might be some of the install happening after, uh, but we're getting it all maximized within within the project deadlines to get the tax credit for it. Okay. Update on operations. Doing a lot better on our vacancies, um, especially now that we have a fully staffed maintenance team and hoping in 2025 to add another maintenance person um, to really round it out. Um, for Aspen Meadows neighborhood, we do have um, some units down right now um, that need some work. The biggest one is Aspen Meadows B2. Um, that one was a meth unit. That was a complete rebuild and tear down. And I'm happy to say we are going to move forward with complete remediation and contract that out and get that unit finally done and rented. Um, we had gotten a quote from the same company that helped us initially do the drywall. Um, it was someone that we worked with that had ties to Habitat. Um, and so we're going to go again with them to get the unit up which has been sort of a thorn in the side for everybody mm -hmm. to have something vacant sitting for so long because you can find it in many ways. Um, and, then, uh, and then also at the suites, we have the meth unit, um, 7228, that we need to get remediated. We are going to move forward with um, getting some cleaning done, but we're just getting a on the rebuild portion of that and what that will entail. So we're hoping to get those finished by the end of the year because if it's occupiable mm -hmm. by December 31st, we get to account it for tax credits. If oh, it's great. not, then we lose tax credits for that year. Mm -hmm. And that creates issues for the investor. Um, so we want to try to get those two units up and running. Um, Spring Creek 111, that one, um, unfortunately, we need to rip out the floors. Or not, not Spring, did I say Spring Creek? Sorry, that's supposed to be AMSA. Um, it's one. Aspen Meadow Senior. Oh, okay. That one we have to rip out the floors. They're soiled and the, we can't get this on. So, um, so yeah, we'll be ripping those floors up and closing those. Um, and then C5 was an eviction, and that just that's a full unit turn. It was it, someone lived there for. 12 years, 12 years. So it just needs a lot of touch up and work and love to bring it back. Um, but those are some of the big ones. Um, so we have four pending make ready status um, at Aspen Meadows Neighborhood, two ready to rent at Aspen Meadows Senior once we fix the flooring. Um, Fall River has two vacants and they're working to fill that. Um, Spring Creek has. Um, a few vacants, they've had some turnover recently. Um, Hearthstone and Motor Cross is fully leased. Lodge is fully leased. We do have a vacant coming where we have a death of a tenant. Um, no family, so we have to go, sadly, and it seems like such a waste of time, um, we have to go through an eviction process because we, we have to post the rents not paid for 30 days and then wait and then evict the person in court who isn't alive. So I'm trying to get in it's touch with our sad. yeah I'm trying to get in touch with our attorney to see if there's any sort of administrative process to shorten yeah. the time because that's yeah. potentially three months of rent that we're not going to get. And then the suites we have um, so we have six vacant with MHP, um, but we've had two move-ins last week, so those units we're finally seeing the payoff of moving to the local case conferencing, the shift that we had. Um, with the state and MHP on um, switching where we get our um, referrals from. And so we're working really hard to bring those units up and get them filled with um, on the MHP side. Um, 
Village on Main, we have four vacant units left out of 15. Mm. Um, Kat has been doing a great job to fill up all the vacants that have either come from people vacating before the project or during, um, or they moved on somewhere else. Um, so working hard to get, like um, Molly said, get all the paperwork to the lender and investor to approve. And then at Briarwood, we have two that um, Patrick's been working really hard to sort of just bring bring back, get new flooring, replace um, cover plates for like other couple outlets, mm -hmm. just clean up and paint. Um, they needed a little love, so we're hopefully gonna get those two um, rented out soon. I've got Diana working with the maintenance and property managers really closely to the enhance and contact with our agencies. So that's what's going on with the occupancy report. Um, also trying to have conversations with everybody about um, benchmarks and goals. We want to get to a place where we're not having units sit for 30 days or longer. Mm -hmm. It's um, sort of been a hard thing to tackle. Um, some of these, some of these units have been um, beaten up for lack of better words just taken a meeting from tenants, especially the ones at the suites, and then if, you know, the older the property, the more it takes to bring it up. So, we're working on that. And then for property updates, um, one big thing that has been sort of a recurring theme that since the summer started has been the landscaping. Um, we've had a lot of issues with that company that we did address with them, and they've been doing much better. Um, and They've been really responsive now, and they're doing a lot. We've ripped out some, a lot of plans at the suites that were causing some public safety issues mm -hmm. on the back part of the property, and um, they're taking care of a lot of the weeds and bushes that were over there. One nice thing that came out of um, sort of like happenstance was Forestry reached out to Molly and offered mm -hmm. to take care of all of our trees at no cost oh, wow. in, in partnership with the city, okay. and that's been huge. Um, so we had to, we did remove some, some trees along um, the Hearthstone and Lodge that were um, infected with the mold ash borer. So they were going to get those um, replaced. But all the properties are looking really good. Um, we had Kaiser come. They're, I think they're a non-profit anyway, but their non-profit fun wing mm -hmm. of Kaiser Permanente has been coming to the properties this month and doing ice cream socials. Nice. Um, so they don't do any sort of pitching or anything, they're just there having the time. Um, just getting everybody some ice cream and having fun. Um, and then updates on hiring. We hired a new assistant community manager. She started Monday. Um, we also have hired another one who will start September. And then we have a third who we were hoping would start sooner. She hasn't like officially accepted, we're still getting there, but um, if, assuming she does. She'll be starting in October. So, um, working to, to get fully staffed there. Um, then the regional property manager job announcement went live yesterday. Mm -hmm. So, I hired you know, two people to so, be working from that position. It'll make life easier for me. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be great. It'll be great for my team. Um, to have mm -hmm. support because I that's not property management is not my background so I feel like I'm, well. I'm doing okay. <laughs> I was gonna say you this has been you've been talking about this how mm -hmm. this wasn't exactly how we thought it would go when you started but it's been this deep dive I think is going to be very valuable um, getting on the ground with everybody really getting ingrained and then be able to hire and know. Yeah. Exactly what we're looking for. Yeah. Um, so I won't go in like page by page by page. But, um, <laughs> um, but what we're seeing is um, Aspen Meadows neighborhood, the senior apartments, and Briarwood. We are over budget on our vacancies. Um, we budgeted at 96%.
but we've had some units there that have needed some extra TLC that have taken a longer time. Um, along with trying to get individuals in that could pay the rent. Um, so what we're finding is we're having them to reduce the rent to a different percentage. Let's say it's 50 percent, but we're reducing it to 45 to try to get somebody in there because um, you're just losing rent if you're not renting it to anybody. So um, trying to make sure that it works within the budget. Um, a couple of and the suites is, is close to being there. Um, they'll be on the budget next quarter for sure. Um, as far as expenses go, Briarwood and the suites, kind of how I gauge it is like, is it over 50% in the second quarter? Are we over 50% on any of these expenditures? Um, and the suites is over on their maintenance, and a lot of that is ha has to do with the health and safety. Um, we had a lot of costs um, just for meth testing. We're probably $24,000 over in budget just on that, on that line item. Um, along with insurance repairs um, at the Briarwood. We had two units that had insurance uh, claims um, that got rebuilt in their, their house now, but we also have two others that need some TLC as well. That's very fun. So those are the two expense areas that seem to be a little bit of squabble. But um, other than that, everything's looking well. We're trying to, we, you know, we had a a good session today to see what we could do. It's very long. <laughs> to see what we could do to get some of these units because we really want to get, we want to have no down units at the end of 2024 mm -hmm. um, so that uh, our investors don't lose time. Right? So that's our goal. Um, and then AR, nothing really changes. Everything in AR, it's kind of a, you know, you have evictions, costs go up because you have damages, and then you go to write them off, send them to collections. Um, we've only seen one out of all the collections we've sent. They've only had one individual that they were actually able to find. Um, and so they are looking to take that person to court that we have to decide if, if we want to proceed with that. So. Oh my gosh. Are you finding that there are more people who cannot afford the rent and uh, Housing authority because I know your rent is specifically much. seniors and 50% AMI units. Oh, really? We don't have very many 60% AMI units. Those are now something we try not to build in to the projects as much as possible, trying to get them lower and higher and balance in the middle. But um, we know that a 50% AMI unit is generally higher than what if you're on a social security income, it's mm -hmm. higher than you can afford for that. So that's some of those have clearly been a challenge. Any yeah, other? yeah, it's kind of crazy because even when you're in the 60s, you know, the main are people that are just over the limit mm -hmm. or people that are under the limit. Uh -huh. And so you're, you're kind of battle, battling it on two fronts. Yeah. And they're too high for the 50%. Yeah, you may you make too much money for the 50%. We know our any, our thirty percent units never have a problem. We right. know that there's a high need for those. Those are also the hardest ones to build into projects. You need some of those higher AMI units to balance it out. Pay for it. Um, so that's one benefit of income averaging that we will see play out here with Chrisman two and then Ascent um, is in exchange for adding some 70 and 80 percent AMI and more middle income units. It allows us to get more thirty percent outside. So, okay. All right, help me say a few things. Sarah. Well, talking with Harold earlier this week, we'll talk about cameras. Um, looks like the, we're going to be finding some money to get cameras at the suites that originally wasn't planned for mm -hmm. um, at this point. So, we'll be walking the property with the company that we're using for purchasing and install. Sam, so, do you want the Zinnian camera plan to cross-reference? So yes, I would, I, I would definitely. Because if, if there's a section that's not covered by their camera, we want to know. Is that, has that already been done? Okay. So, we're, so we're, where we're finding the funding is 
So we're still getting ARPA interest, so I've talked to you all about ARPA interest, and we need to start washing that concern and start getting it out the door. And, and so uh, the ARPA interest number went up again. So we're looking at it as, as a source for the cameras and the suites. What is that interest rate? Uh, so our, I think we've been over 5%. Mm -hmm. And so it's good there because that money just becomes ours under the, the Treasury guidance. Mm -hmm. It's not great when you're making 5% on debt because you end up going into arbitrage. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Jim's been doing a lot of arbitrage calculations in terms of what can we actually keep versus what we have to turn back over because of the interest. Um, so what it's doing is, is it's allowing us to fill some of these voids. And so we don't have to tackle this piece. One of the things that I'm noodling is if there's an issue in maybe rehabbing these units to kind of get a sense of what the global number is and then I may come back to you all and go, because it's touching housing, can I use some of this interest money in this case? But I'm also trying to balance it against the broader camera piece within the entire city and what we're doing because we know those cameras are having a, a, a tangible impact on activities that are occurring in areas. So I need to do some work on that. Um, but I'll bring that back to you potentially at the city side. And as far as the cameras for the rest of the properties, we are um, very close. Like, I want to say, I hope by the end of this year we don't have to talk about cameras anymore. <laughs> I'm, I'm really hoping. So, fingers crossed, um, Village on Main will have cameras installed first. But, um, really close to purchasing that equipment and moving forward with it, so. Um, as far as our meth uh, detectors go, I meet tomorrow finally with the gentleman that, um, the company's called IntelliGuard, and I, I briefly spoke to you about this. It's a cleaning it's a company. They basically sell, I learned, um, to the military. They sell to other law enforcement, uh, military, like playing as a military. But basically this product um, removes things such as anthrax from surfaces, meth, fentanyl, um, and it basically it's a spray and it becomes biodegradable on the surface. So uh, meet with him tomorrow actually. Couldn't have to go down there and tour the facility and see what costs are. Um, so I think that will definitely help us on the city side of the bathroom as well. So. And then as far as uh, I actually was able to get some good numbers for you for calls for service, um, low. Total uh, for all properties are 44 for the, the month. Oh, that's good. Um, 23 were at the suites. And that was mostly core check-ins, welfare checks, okay. and a few trespassing uh, calls. How so, does that compare to maybe... A year ago, yeah. When, when whatever you would say it was high. Well, when we first took it over, how many a week? Oh, we we were there six, seven, eight times a week, and I really think it cycles because of the, um, you know, when like if someone is is having an episode and the, you know they're and there's a several of them having some mental health issues, we'll see core there a lot. We'll see. So we really need to dive into the data, like what kind of calls we're seeing there. So, but when we first took the suites over, we were there a lot. Mm -hmm. So. I mean, you and I would be there four or five times a week. Yeah. We would personally yeah. be there. So I mean, breakdown for the rest of the properties: Briarwood had zero, the Lodge had four, Carstone had three, AMSA had three, AMN had one. Mm -hmm. So that is a, also a you know, multifamily that, that usually is a high driver for calls for service, and that's that's excellent. Village on Main had two, Spring Creek had three, and Fall River had seven. So, so A and M, A and M work, we work with Sarah. So part of the challenge that we were seeing at Landing Park is related to the I think I told you all the Russian olive trees that were on the corner that was also now then impacting A and M. 
that could have contributed to some calls for service because they were breaking into people's patios. Mm -hmm. So that's why we made the decision to work with the property owner to cut those trees because it would minimize the impact. And it's interesting, I live in the area. Mm -hmm. It's like night and day different when those trees went down in Germany. Really? What we're just seeing globally within all the adjoining neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Just more visual. Well, I mean, we would have, what, 15 people in the trees? Yeah, the canopy was so low that, I mean, you couldn't see in there. You had to physically walk in. That's how overgrown the trees were. So they were there. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And, and what, many of the people that lived there were the people we were challenged with at Landon Park. They were the people that we were challenged with at Aspen Meadow. And, and then if you lived in the area, you would just see activity all over the place. Mm -hmm. And um, it's night day different. So, uh, Did you find a lot of stuff inside those trees when they went down? Yeah. Even in the bushes at the streets? We found skis, backpack full of weird stuff. Skis? Skis. Like a nice pair of skis. Mm -hmm. You've got to have those once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> you got to have those around in case it snows. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Any questions for me? That's all I have. No, I think that one of the best reports that we've had with the low impact. And, uh, so the way yeah. yeah. So the way the camera system is going to work is so we're using Milestone as the video management system. That that's going to integrate everything. Mm -hmm. And and so what it's going to do from a public safety standpoint is if we have a call for service, they're going. Is it the Sergeants or the commanders are going to have access. Different people will have different access, but it allows us to we'll, kind we'll of all have them. access, but um, it, it, like we'll have it up in patrol briefing. We'll have all all the cameras pulled up, and they'll be able to. If there's a call for service and someone happened to be there, they can basically get on the system, review it, and see literally like things, you know, cars are driving away, people running away, being able to identify that now, and then getting officers there with that information. So it's going to integrate our facility cameras, our housing authority cameras, so then, you know, so the housing authority, probably most of the staff here will have access to them. The property managers will have access to their property cameras, um, and it's, it's cycling into this, this broader video management system. The video management system also, because it's not proprietary, when we get to the point next year we're going to, we have to change our access control system because you've all seen doors won't open, doors, yeah. the garage doors get stuck. Mm -hmm. So it'll allow us to integrate our access control systems in our facility so that we can integrate with the camera so that we can set times where no one's supposed to be here, and if somebody badges in, the cameras won't, won't see who it is. Wow. And that'll help us, I think, a lot at um, our housing authority properties. It's a big issue with people getting in or catching doors that are open. Um, and then it kind of will then aggregate into parking management. So then if you have the cameras where you're managing the parking lots, it'll let us manage that too. So um, it really is, what it's going to be is this other force multiplier that we haven't seen that actually will reduce the demand of staff time, mm -hmm. which when we look at, it's more of a cost avoidance over time because we don't have to add as many positions. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we look at it from a public safety standpoint, we know that it drastically reduces the time that it takes them, which actually then means we have people on the street for more time without necessarily adding additional positions. Okay. So um, that's going to be a big change for us. And then we're trying to figure out how we, and this isn't for housing authority, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you how that works within the Vision Zero piece. Because the Vision Zero folks are telling us we need to, we have issues. We have a camera system that we were testing at 17th of May. Mm -hmm. We had 15,000 people in five weeks. Run red lights. Oh. Yeah. Now, some of those. Oh, no. some of, I saw one today that was it was completely red when he entered. The so some of those. So some wow. of those were people that were in the turning lane. Yeah. So 
you know, I'm sitting there looking at accident data and the maps that we had, the speeds that we're seeing, understanding the challenges that we're having from a staffing perspective on officers because they're all jumping calls. Mm -hmm. So they're pulling together something right now as part of Vision Zero, our camera project, and looking at funding to say, because now the law lets us put speed trailers out where they, it's a civil infraction. Okay. And so when you're speeding, it, it hits it, a company gets it, and they bill you. Uh -huh. um, so we're now looking at that, and we're looking at red light cameras. Because even if we assumed only a third of people... I want those red light cameras. Yeah. Even if we're assuming only a third of the people... Well, I've already, told, I've already told my wife, I said, we need to set aside some money on the speeding piece because uh -huh. I'm yeah. not real great at it. But uh -huh. even if we assumed a third... Uh -huh. That's 5,000 people in five weeks. Uh -huh. And how many of those were near misses? Mm, and, yeah. and so yeah. um, we'll be bringing that to you all because, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's real. The people are complaining to us. They're complaining to you all yeah. about speeding and these issues. We can't keep saying we don't have the personnel to do this. And so we're going to have to use technology, technology. to help us balance this. So all of this is an integrated approach that we'll be bringing um, to the council. Things are so circular. We were dealing with that when I was on the first day. Yeah. <laughs> it just always. Oh. And the speeds are crazy. I mean, oh, yeah. all these example, I can look at the chart and the data. Three seconds late on a red light. Five seconds late on a red light. Yeah. It is insane what people are doing. We're seeing a lot of young kids on these electric bikes too, though. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I went on a, a tour with the uh, Parks and Rec folks to the different parks uh, as part of the board uh, activity. In three different locations around town, literally totally separate in different uh, sectors, and we were seeing uh, gangs of like middle school, high school, young high school riding around on these bikes almost like motorcycle gangs, popping wheelies, running lights, and you know, just something else. And, and, and uh, David Bell is like, What? <laughs> okay. okay, that is it for the updates. I'd like a motion to adjourn. I just want thanks to Molly for coming to the uh, uh, Bold Ten Consortium of Cities and, and really shining and showing them, you know, that we've just got this stellar staff and, the, and folks that really know what we're talking about. So, good job. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to adjourn. <laughs> Second. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Yeah, no, I'm just...